Praise the Lord, church. How many of you are excited to be in the house of God today? If you could please stand all across the sanctuary. We're going to sing and glorify God together. Hallelujah. How many of you know the blood still works? The blood of Jesus that was shed way back on Calvary. It still flows today. It doesn't matter what our past is. God, in his infinite wisdom, sent his own, he wrapped him all in his own self in flesh and died on the cross that we could have atonement for our sins. And so here in just a second, we're going to talk about that. We're going to sing and glorify God about the blood still works. So why don't you worship with us, praise God.
There is power, power, wonder working power. Come on, if you've been washed in that blood, turn to somebody and say, I believe there is power. Oh, it's wonder working power in the precious blood. Come on, let's just have church for a little bit. There is power. Turn to your other neighbor. Say, there's wonder working power for you in the blood. One more time with no music. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the land. right here. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. In the precious blood of the Lamb. One more time, there there's is power, power. Whatever you need, there's power, power in the blood. blood of the Lamb. Oh, yes, there, there is power, power. Wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, and we're going to sing this one more time. We're going to sing it one more time, but somebody needs to hear this. If you can, put up Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. 
See, we're not just singing a song. We're not just singing words that are, that are written long ago, but they're real and they're powerful and they're based on the Word of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. See, we quote the prophet Isaiah, but it's recorded right here in the New Testament as well. It says, it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. That's Isaiah. Himself. Who's that talking about? Jesus. Jesus himself took our infirmities and he bare our sicknesses. He went to the cross not just to save us from our sins, but he went to the cross. Another scripture says that with or by his stripes, we're healed. We're healed. And I believe that verse doesn't just apply to a physical sickness, but it, it applies to mental, emotional, and spiritual sicknesses and wounds. Do I have anybody that has some faith to believe with me today? Now, it's just now 1144, not even 1145. Can we just take about five minutes? We're going to sing this song one more time. And I'm going to open these altars. And if you have a need in your body, if you've got a need in your spirit, in your family, it doesn't matter if it's financial, emotional, mental, or if you need to be saved from your sins. It doesn't matter what it is. There is power in the blood. Now listen, whether you stay in your seat or whether you come forward, it doesn't matter, but you got to have one thing. Hebrews says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can sing the song all day long, it won't do you any good if you don't have faith. But if you begin to worship the Lord, if you begin to praise Him, and if you will sing the song in faith, activate your mind, activate whatever faith you've got, Jesus said it just takes faith as a size, a size of a mustard seed. A tiny seed can move a mountain. So you don't have to have a whole lot. You just have, have to have enough to say, Lord, I believe there is power, wonder-working power in your blood. So we're going to sing this one more time. You do whatever you feel to do. But I believe somebody in the house needs a miracle. And if you'll activate your faith, God can do it right now. Not in an hour, not tomorrow, not next week, but right now. If you'll step out in some way, shape, or form and exercise faith, God can do it right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's sing this. Well, would you be free from your burden of sin? You see, there's power in the blood. Come on. There's power in the blood. Would you or evil the victory? I said there's wonderful power.
taken away your sins. It doesn't matter what problems you face. There's a new life that's coming. There'll be no sickness. There'll be no problems. And if you've experienced the salvation of Jesus Christ, you have that promise. One day, one day we're going to go to heaven. We're going to re rejoice in for all eternity because of what he did. Hallelujah. It's all because of this. Let's see it.
you alive. The power of the blood of Jesus is what keeps us. Can anybody witness to that? Is the power of the blood of Jesus keeping you today? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb today? Hallelujah. There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. Hallelujah. Whatever situation you face today, there's power in the blood for that situation. There's power in his blood for your life today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As the ushers get ready to take up an offering hallelujah I just want to share a couple things with you real quick you know there's power in the blood hallelujah when I was a baby my parents said that I died and they prayed God if it's your will okay we can let them go but if it's not then raise them up it was the devil's desire for me to go and not be here. But God, God saw fit for me to be here. Hallelujah. Because of the prayers and pleading the blood of Jesus, I'm here today. Amen. There's power in the blood. There's situation after situation as I grew up in my life where I watched God keep his hand on me and my family, where the angels of God were surrounding us. <laughs> in spite of the devil's attack, in spite of his desire upon our lives, the angels of the Lord kept us. Hallelujah. The Bible says that he gave the angels charge over us, lest we should even dash our foot against a stone. Hallelujah. How many know there's power in the blood? I don't care whatever the situation is, the blood of Jesus, there's power in the blood of Jesus. The devil has tried to destroy my family, tried to destroy me. There's countless time after time where God has kept me. And if it would have been up to the devil, he would have done it. I don't care what situation you face. If you're under the blood of Jesus, God is going to keep you. Whatever you're facing, God is going to keep you. I'm here to tell somebody. This is real. You need to know that this is real. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Amen. I don't care. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. I don't care what the devil's intent against you is. He will not prosper. He will not prosper. If you're under the blood, if you're under the blood, the devil cannot touch you. How many believe that? How many believe that the devil is out to attack you today and he wants to destroy you today? Do you believe that today? How many of you believe the blood of Jesus could keep you? That's right. Today, as we, as we, before we take this offering, we're going to lift our voices and we're going to plead the blood of Jesus because there's lives in here that the devil would love to take you out today. He would love to destroy you today. He would love for your final step to be before you even came into these doors. He didn't want you here. But he would love it if he could take you out when you leave here. Do you believe that? You have an enemy. And he is out for your soul. But today, we're going to plead the blood of Jesus. We're going to plead the blood of Jesus over your life, over your family, over your children. We're going to plead the blood of Jesus that he's going to watch over you and keep you that no harm will come to you or your family, but that God is going to give his angels charge on you. Do you believe that today? Come on. Does anybody believe that today? We're going to lift our voices together, and we're going to pray, and we're going to plead the blood of Jesus. We're going to pray for every individual in here. 
Everyone out up here and everyone down there. In the process, I want you to pray over your pastor. I want you to plead the blood of Jesus. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Too many times I've heard testimony after testimony of where the devil tried to come in and attack and God stopped it. This is real. This is real. Come on, let's lift our voices. In the name of Jesus. Devil, I bind you in Jesus' name. I bind you in Jesus' name. You are a liar. You have no authority in this place. Devil, I command you in the name of Jesus, whatever your plans are, whatever your desire is, I command it to cease in the name of Jesus. Come on, church, pray. Come on. Come on, church, you need to pray. Whatever the mission is, I command it to be stopped in Jesus' name. I command it to cease in Jesus' name. If your plans are meant for harm, if your plans are meant to destroy, I command that the stake of the angel of God will be driven through the top of your head to the sole of your feet if you make one step toward any person or man of God in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, church. We take authority in this house. We take authority in this house. We take authority in this house. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, dispatch your angels right now. Dispatch your angels right now. In the name of Jesus. All right, church, put your hands toward pastor. Put your hands toward pastor. In the name of Jesus. Angel of God. Angel of God. Angel that carries a flaming sword. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you have an offering, begin to bring it. But bring it rejoicing. Rejoicing in the, the fact that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Do it with rejoicing and thanksgiving unto God that you have this opportunity today. And while you're at the altar, if you need to pray, don't even leave. We're going to sing and we're going to worship some more. If you need to pray, come on to the altar. If you need to repent, come on to the altar. Hallelujah. God is here for you today. God is here to restore you today. He's here to set you free today. This altar is where this happens. Come on. I see a crimson stream of love.
more time. Every voice lifted. I see a crimson sea of love. of the Lord in the sanctuary. Amen. Such an awesome God. Let's give our choir a hand today. Thank you for obeying the Holy Ghost. Love our choir. God bless you. You can be seated for a few moments. Next Sunday, everybody say next Sunday, is Friends Sunday. It is our special day. We're going to pull together, and we need everybody to invite every friend that you got next Sunday. This is what's going to take place. We're going to invite our friends. We'll have a great time of Sunday school and a great time of worship. And by the way, I said Sunday school. I want to give a, a great thank you to all of our Sunday school teachers that take time to study their word and get here on time to teach every Sunday. Let's give them a hand clap. Thank you for every teacher that dedicates your time for that. Amen. But next Sunday is going to be awesome. We're going to have a Friends Sunday. We're going to have a 22-foot water slide for the children and any adult that's not scared to get on it. And then we're going to have barbecue, and uh, it's going to be awesome. We're going to, I ordered enough barbecue to feed 200 people. And Wednesday night, we announced that we're going to take up a special offering, and this is what's going to cover. That's going to cover uh, next Sunday's expense that it's going to cost for that because we don't want to take up an offering when our friends are in the house. And I usually don't like taking up two offerings, but that's what this is for because whatever comes in this bucket, we're going to put it toward Friends Sunday next Sunday. And if we get enough, we'll rent two slides. But if I don't get enough, I have to rent one slide. So we give you an opportunity to give today and bless. We have our app up and running. You can give on that as well if you want to download our church app. It's free, and it's got all of our dates and Bible and live streaming. All that's on there, so you can check it out. But if you would, let's all stand one more time. We're in a Pentecostal church, right? You stand and sit. You stand and sit. So let's pray over this Friend Sunday for next Sunday. I'm praying that God's going to fill the house up with 500 people this next Sunday. Does that got anybody to believe with me? 500 people. Everybody say this with me. If I would do my part, it will happen. Amen. And it will if we would do our part. Let's pray. God will bless this offering. What this is going to do is going to bless our friends Sunday. Next Sunday, give what you can. If it's a dollar, twenty dollars, I always ask people, what would it cost you to go out and eat next Sunday? Well, how about give that much? Whatever it costs you to eat. If that's what you, that just giving you an idea because you're going to be fed for free next week and it's going to be awesome barbecue and you don't want to miss it. Let's pray. God, I love you. Thank this opportunity today that you're giving me to be here to stand and pray over this offering. Next Sunday means a lot to me to invite friends to come from everywhere tomorrow, next Sunday. We're going to have a great time on the grounds, but we're also going to have a great time in this house. And we're going to believe many lives are going to be changed. Many lives are going to be saved. And we ask you to bless this time, God, as people are about to give toward this, Lord, to help us reach friends this next Sunday in Jesus' name. God bless you, and I want you to bring your offering and meet a friend before you go back to your seat with a knuckle hit, well, uh, whatever you call that, not in the face, but, uh, you know, bump, knuckle bump, that'd be fine, or shake hands. God bless you. Bring your offering, and the Lord will bless you for it today. Amen. A couple announcements while you're coming doing that. Don't forget about uh, the 28th of this month is our young married couples uh, going together, getting together, and that is going to be held. We're going to meet here at 4 o'clock that day, and your, hut, your spouse has got to go to Goodwill and buy you a, a clothes for that, for that date they're going to have that night. And whoever is dressed the best on that date night will be the winner for 
those young married couples. We did that a year or so ago, and they voted today to do it again next, the 28th of this month. So put that on your calendar. We will meet here at 4 o'clock, amen, and go out for that. Praise the Lord. God bless you today. Thank you for the giving today. How many knows God is more powerful than any situation? He's more big than any, any dilemma that you have in your life. Whatever you need, God is bigger than that. So we'll just leave the buckets here, uh, ushers, and if anybody wants to give out through the day, that's fine too. Uh, but I want to uh, preach to you today. You can be seated because I'm going to talk to you a minute before I get into the reading of the Word of God today. But I really got uh, a title that I'm not going to put up until I tell them to put it up because it's, uh, when God spoke this title to me, it kind of scared me. It kind of made me weak. And uh, so I, I really... Don't know how I'm going to say it, get it out, but I'm going to read a little bit. Maybe I can get it out after I read a little bit about what I'm about to read. I found these statistics, and it kind of just moved me in my spirit. But it's, I'm going to read them if you don't mind. If you just give me a minute here. But on the night of April the 14th, 1912, was anybody born at that time? Anybody? I don't think so, because that was a long time ago. But during this first trip from England to New York, the Titanic struck an iceberg. The collision tore about a 300-foot gash into the hull, and two hours, two and a half hours, this unsinkable ship sank. Somewhere around 1,500 people died. Then there's another one on May the 6th, 1937, in Lakehurst, New Jersey. The mighty German Zeppelin, Hindenburg, Hitt, Hitt, was attempting to moor him. The Hindenburg was on the NASA, the NASA of Germany's finest airships. It was supposed to represent the greatness of German and, the, and its leaders. Adolf Hitler. It had just crossed the Atlantic in its maiden voyage of the year when it exploded and 36 people died. It was on August the 31st, 1997, that Diana, the Princess of Wales, was killed shortly after midnight in an automobile accident in, t in a tunnel by, by the Seine or Seine River in Paris. On September the 11th, we all remember this one. It's getting closer to home, right? 2001 hijacked airplanes. And the, the hands of the tears crashed into the World Trade Center in Pentagon. Nearly 3,000 people died that day. On the day of Christmas 2004, Master Tsunami hit several countries in South Asia and Africa, and 150,000 people died in one day. On the morning of August the 29th, 2005, a hurricane called Katrina battered the Gulf Coast of the United States. It was the sixth strongest Atlantic hurricane recorded in history. Its damage is estimated around $75 billion, making it the, the costliest hurricane ever to happen in history of the United States. As of March the 20th, 2006, it was confirmed the death total stood at 1,604 people, making it the deadliest U.S. hurricane since 1928. And today, I want to talk to us today simply on a title that's going to probably shake you or morbid or whatever you want to call it to you today. But I want to title today simply this, if they'll put it up, Are You Ready to Die? When I thought of this title, I thought, well, when Facebook sees this title, they're probably going to delete me again off Facebook because they think I'm threatening anybody. I'm not threatening anybody, but I want to ask the question in my title today, Are You Ready to Die? It was in Isaiah chapter 38, and you're already seated, just, just stay seated down. But Isaiah 38 and 1 talks about Hezekiah was sick unto death. And Isaiah, the prophet of the son of Amos, said to him, and said, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. How would you like for the prophet to look at you today and say, You're fixing to die? How would you feel? You would probably be a little bit like Hezekiah was. He said in the very next verse, Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall, and he began to pray to the Lord. I don't know about you, but if God looked at me today and said, You're fixing to die, I would say, Y'all go have lunch. I'm not leaving. Y'all go ahead and have you a good day, whatever you do, but I'm going to stay because this is my last time to be in the house of God. But watch what he did. He prayed. He turned himself to a wall. And he said, remember now, O Lord, beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in the sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Now, could you blame him from weeping and praying and, and begging God for more life? How often do we beg for God for more life? 
Come on, some of you, I've been to your hospital when you was laying on your back. The doctor's not giving you much hope. And I prayed, God, put life back in one more time. And you're here, and I know you're thankful that somebody stood in the gap. Somebody prayed when I couldn't pray for myself. I'm thankful for that. But wouldn't it be just an amazing thing today, or would it just shock you if God walks in the house or brings a prophet today to you and tell you that you're about to die? Some of you would get quiet and nervous like I was when I read this, and I said, God, what are you trying to tell me? I'm going to title today, Are You Ready to Die? Because I want to tell you, death is a reality, amen, and you cannot deny it. It doesn't matter what we do. We got to do like God or the prophet told Hezekiah, set thine house in order. Church, I'm going to tell you, if it ever was a day in 2001, we need to get our houses in order. And I'm not talking about just looking right either, but I'm talking about acting right. Come on, we think if we got to look down, we're all right. That's not what it takes. Anybody can put a suit on. Anybody can let their hair grow out. Anybody can smell good. Come on, but it takes a, somebody that says, you know what, I'm ready to get my house in order. And that's what the prophet said, set that house in order for thou shalt die and not live. I'm going to read some more scripture to you today if you want to write them down because I'm going to read them really quick and I hope they can get, keep up with me on the board. But Genesis 3.19 talks about the sweat of the face, shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. For out of it was it were taken, for dust doeth thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Come on, we all know that's where we go back to. We all are appointed to die. We're going to read that text as well. It's Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. To everything, there is a season. I'm going to tell you, I, I, didn't, I learned that a few years ago. We're all only here for a season. That's right. I'm only here for a season. I'm only at Carrieville First Pentecostal Church for a season. Now, when is my season over? I don't know. I'm hoping it's when God takes me out in a casket, out those doors, and I'm, I'm worshiping and shouting over in the streets of gold. I don't know when it's going to be, but we're all seasonal. But he said, everything, there is a season, a time for every purpose under the, under the heaven. He said, it's a time to be born, but it's a time to die, a time to plant. It's a time to pluck up that which is planted. You know, I'm, I'm going to pause right here because I feel like I need to say this. We all want to talk about living, but we want to talk about dying. But it is just as much of a part of, our, our, of life as it is of living. Even though life's got, you know, that dash that goes between the date that you were born and, and the date that you die, you know, that dash on the, on the tombstone, that means a lot more than anything on that tombstone because that dash tells of all the living that you've done. But death happens in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to happen. First Timothy 6 and 17 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and certain we can carry nothing out. Was it Job that said it? Um, maybe I gave you the wrong verse. I'm sorry. But, but it was Job that said, naked I came in this world, and naked shall I leave. It was Job that put himself into the position and saying, you know what? I am down to nothing. But that's the way I came in this world. Hebrews chapter 9, 27, which we all know, and it says, it's appointed that a man wants to die, and then after this, the judgment. It's amazing how we can be good judges here. And it, we don't even really know what we're judging. We're just estimating and guessing that this is the way it's going to go. There's a lot of innocent people in prison today. Did y'all know that? There's a lot of innocent people there, but the judge saw it away, and he judged. He can't even judge properly. There's a lot of people in prison that say they're innocent too. I understand all of that. But this is the way we live. Judgment is, is everywhere. Judgment is in our minds, in our hearts. And you can say you don't judge if you want to, but every service you're judging somebody in a certain way. But this is the thing, my friend. The judgment is going to come from God, and that's what's going to matter. The judgment, no matter what you say about Brother Hunt today, it really probably don't matter. It's probably not the truth. No way if, if you really look at it and study it out. But on that day, when I stand before God, his judgment is going to matter. I'm not going to be able to look at God and say, God, but, but I was in church every Sunday. But God... I did exactly what Brother Hunt requested of me. I was there for pre-service prayer. I was there on time for Sunday school. I listened to the Word of God. I gave according to you. I did all. Guess what? It ain't going to matter on that day because when Jesus makes a judgment call, that's the way it's going to go. Romans 5 and 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man 
sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. For that have all, they all have sinned. So remember this, we all are sinners. But remember what I told you a few weeks ago, that there's mercy and goodness is following you all the days of your life, and so is grace, because we're seeing a bound. Grace doeth much more bound. We have an opportunity to give our life to God. This is a day the Lord has made. This is a day God's given us breath one more time to come to the house of God. My friend, you may not have been planning on having much activity in your life today, but I come today to tell you my God is still in the saving business. My God is still in the healing business. My God is still in the delivering business. I'm going to tell you what other business he's in. He's in the business of delivering people from depression. He said in one count of the scripture, he said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Friend, when you get weak, you need to go searching for the joy. When you get down, begin to get in the altar. You know how you get joy? When the singing is going on, come to the front and put some joy in your life. My Bible says if I want joy, I got to leap for it. When's the last time you just got in the altar and just started leaping for joy? Come on. This is a thing I got to tell you. It's almost like when I was growing up. When I was growing up, Mama says, when it's time to eat, she meant come and eat. If you didn't eat and she cleaned the dishes up, you might get a beating if you go back in there in the kitchen, rambling around and messing up her kitchen again. And it's almost like this. God pours out his blessing, and that's when he says, come and get it. And if we don't get it, it's our fault. It's almost like when, you, when, you're, when you're depressed and you don't come to get it, and you leave depressed, don't blame the preacher. Don't blame the person sitting beside you or the person that, that keeps talking while you're trying to listen to the church service. Did y'all know y'all interrupt people when you're talking the whole time I'm preaching? You're interrupting somebody. Right now, when somebody starts talking around you, you need to turn around and say, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. That'll shut them up or they'll move one. Praise God. Y'all don't bother me when I'm preaching. If you're talking, I don't never hear you because I've I, I got a way of, of zoning it out and put my face toward it where I need to put it toward, and that's toward heaven. But I want to tell you today, we, we are missing what God has for us because when God pours it out, when, when the spout opens up and the joy comes down, you and I got to get under the spout to where it's coming out at, and we got to say, God, pour it on me today. So I, I want to just tell you today the certainty of death is he told Hezekiah, thou shalt die. A rough estimate of the annual deaths, and I'm going to tell you, this is just a rough estimate, because, I, I mean, I found this, and it, I don't know how accurate it is, but it, it, it's scary. I'll put it to you that way. Just a rough estimate of deaths in the world that has happened are about 60 million, or about, and that's about two dying every second. Could you imagine? 60 million people. Is what they said, and about two every second die. Think of it this way, if it's two every second. 120 people are going to die in the next minute. I'm talking about worldwide. 120 people are going to die. 700 or 7,200 people die every hour. 172,800 die every day. Death is a certain thing. One out of... Every person dies. If you look at the statistics and the numbers and you put them the way it says, did you, did, did you get that, what I'm saying tonight or today? Death is a reality. Death is going to happen. Yes, they scared us the last two, two years that 200,000 have died in the United States of America, and we're shook up. But if you go back to 2019, 200,000 died that year. Just with a different disease, or they say different disease. The world has been scared of death. But I want to just tell you today, I'm not scared to die. I don't want to die. You know, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Some of you older folks know that song. But, but yes, we, we, we're there. We don't want to die. But I'm going to tell you, when I was 12 years old, God filled me with the Holy Ghost. At 12 years old... I've been up, I've been down, I've been in, I've been out. I've had situations I had to deal with. I had to get closer to God. I got cold away from God. I had to get back close to God. I've had struggles. Uh, but before I was 12 years old, I remember going to church and the preacher preaching so hard. He preached how, uh, about hell so much that you can feel the flames from hell. Seriously. I mean, I'd be sitting in a pew 
And today, hell doesn't ring nothing. It doesn't mean nothing to nobody no more because we see hell every day. We live in hell every day. I'm not cussing. I'm talking about the place we're going to go if we ain't got the Holy Ghost. Come on. That's what we're living there. Today, we're in it, and it doesn't scare nobody. But when I was a kid, that preacher would preach hell so hot, my friend, I would be nervous. i go home at night. I couldn't sleep. I'm like, i got to have the Holy Ghost. If I don't have the Holy Ghost, I'm going to die, and I'm going to go to that hell that that preacher preached about. And I, couldn't, I was scared to die before 12. But when God gave me the Holy Ghost, guess what I can do now at night? I can lay my head on the bed and pray my prayers. Lord, let my soul to keep. Lord, if I don't wake before I, or if I, if I don't wake up, Lord, to the morning, let my soul go be with thee. I come today to tell the church, the Holy Ghost, a change your whole mindset about death. It'll put something inside of you that take fear out of you. So death is a reality. And our text today was, was a, I would say, a cruelty of death about the prophet came. And he said, he said set that house in order. You know, I, I heard somebody the other day, a preacher preaching. He said, we all follow prophets, or we used to. The people don't really get into that much no more. But they would follow prophets. If they heard there's going to be a prophet across the town, or if it was an hour, a half, two hours away, we'll, we'll sacrifice to drive that two hours away to hear a prophet. And we're praying and hopingly that that prophet is going to come and prophesy over me. And you see, but see what happened over the years, I believe, and I'm not saying I, God told me this, but I believe a lot of pro, uh, prophets, uh, they begin to preach prosperity, and that's why people started following them, see the prosperity. Oh, but I wish, I wish today Isaiah was here. I wish Isaiah would walk up in this place today and then just have his way and start prophesying to us. Because I got a feeling Isaiah wouldn't be worried about you getting a brand new RV to travel the world in. He wouldn't be worried about you getting a brand new car that you got to pay $800 a month on. Come on, he wouldn't be worried about you getting that house, your dream house you've always dreamed of. He wouldn't be coming here prophesying that prosperity is on your way and you got a raise coming your way and you got this happening and you're fixing to see this, you're fixing to see that. But I believe he'll walk in here and he will look at us with them beady eyes and he'll say, my brother, you better get your house in order. You don't have many more days coming your way. You better make sure your life is right. You see, I believe when the prophets begin to prophesy prosperity, 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 God is beginning to, going to wipe those things out. But he's looking for a man to step back in the gap and tell some folks, are you ready to die? When I began to think of this, I thought, oh, God, how am I going to get this out the way you've given it to me? The prophet came to Hezekiah and said, get your house in order. I come today to tell the church we need to get our house in order. He says, this is what he said. Amen. In, in the 2 Kings chapter 18, if you'll read it later, I didn't put it on the board. But it talks about King Hezekiah. He was king of Judah. And he was probably, uh, there never been a king before him, like him, or after him. He was just sold out. He instituted the sweeping of returning throughout all the land of Judah. And Hezekiah was a young king. He came to the throne when he was 25 years old. They, they uh, put him in as king. And he reigned there for 29 years in Jerusalem. You can find that in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 2. But he passed through the time of serious illness. He went through this sickness of his life. When he was 39 years of age, he was going to die. He says, this is it. Your time is up. You're fixing to die. And he turned to the wall and he said, God, give me a few more years. And God ex extended his life for 15 more years. And he died at the age of 54. Now, that's young. 54 years old is only five years away or four and a half years away from what I am today. But, and I'm looking for that senior citizen discount at 55. Praise the Lord. I'm going to let everybody know when I turn that age. That's what I am. But this is the thing. Hezekiah did not even reach that age, 54 years old. And I want to tell you today, and I want to not scare nobody, but if it takes me scaring you to get your heart where it needs to be, so be it. Uh, but I want to tell you, death has no respect to person. It doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. Death doesn't care if you got a Lincoln Town car or you drive the best truck on the market, a Dodge. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to him. It doesn't. Death doesn't care. It's for the rich or the poor. It's for the prince or the pauper. It's for, it's, it, you, you learn to illustrate uh, or, 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 or death because death is just going to come whether you like it or not. Death is always going to be there. In Luke, we find a rich man and a beggar man. 
Luke chapter 15. Let me read that if you don't mind. Luke 16 and 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed of the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died. Everybody say he died. And he was carried into angels, Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. Everybody say he died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being tormented and seeth Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. All of that story, we could preach many different kinds of sermons out of that story today. But this is what I want to bring out to you today. One was rich and one was poor, but they both died. It doesn't matter. It does matter where they went. Yes, it does matter. We, I, I, that's another sermon in itself. Uh, my friend, because I want to tell you, when you die, there's no way you're just going to go sleep for a few thousand years. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord if you got the Holy Ghost. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, uh, you're going to be cast into the lake of fire forever. You're going to burn forever. You're not going to burn, and then that's going to be it, and you're going to die. No, you're not going to do that. Uh, but I want to tell you, you're going to feel the flames, because uh, hell is where the worm dieth not. I come today to tell the church, just as sure as heaven is real, hell is real today. And hell every day is enlarging itself uh, because there's a world that we live in uh, that are backing away from believing uh, the gospel that they like used to believe it. Uh, I'm going to tell you today, if it was wrong 20 years ago, it's still wrong today. Come on. If your preacher preached against it when you was a kid, it's still a sin today. We better stay with the, with the word. So death is something that will happen. Are you ready? No, I'm not ready. I, know, I already answered that. None of you are ready to die. None of us is ready to die. Done a funeral last week that... Really broke my heart. But you know what? The man looked at me a, a, few, a week or two before that. He says, you know what? I want to live as long as God wants me to live. That was the words that came out of his mouth. Uh, he said, I would really like to get about 10 more years. That was his goal. And that was his, his warning to live 10 more years. He would have been 89 years old, almost 90 in 10 years. Not knowing the night before we made his last dinner. We didn't know. My wife cooked the dinner of meatloaf and one of his favorite appetites, meals that he wanted. And so we went over and cooked him meatloaf and potatoes and not knowing that was going to be his last meal. And he says, save it up the rest of it. I'll eat it later. You see, we live on a calendar and we live on a date and we live like I got all the time in the world and this is it. This is what I can do and next week I do this and next Sunday I'm going to get more faithful and next Sunday I'm going to give my life to God and, and when I get this age, when I get retired age, I'll work more for God. And we got all these dates and plans, but church, I come today to tell you we shouldn't operate our spiritual life uh, on a calendar. No, we must live like David said though. When death is real, David said this in Psalms chapter 23 and 4, one of the verses we like to read a lot at funerals, but he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Death is a certain thing to happen, and I want to tell everybody, because I, I want to I reach to the youngest, to the oldest. I'm a chaplain at the hospital, and I'm a chaplain at the police station. I see tragedies all the time. I see it. I, I, a seven-year-old boy keeps coming back to my mind. I got a call to the hospital one night. It wasn't a member of our church. A, a seven-year-old boy had a seizure and fell down, face down into a mud hole, water that deep and drowned in a, in a mud hole. But we live life like it can't happen to me. It'll never come on my side of the fence. The, the, I hear it out there, but it won't happen to me. Brother Brumman, thank you for your prayer just a second ago. Because the moment you said that, God showed me a shield that just went before me. When you prayed for me, I said, oh, I saw a shield. God told me in that just real quick moment, says, I got you, Pastor. I got you, Pastor. You know why? Because I, I made up in my mind a long time ago. I know this old body's not going to live forever. But this soul has got to live forever. It's got to get life with God. It's got to stay strong with God. It's got to live strong with God. 
What do you say when you stand at the foot of a bed when a dad is, oh, my baby, my seven-year-old boy. Mom was getting off an airplane from out of town. She was out of town flying in. She gets to the hospital, and immediately they said, I think we got a heartbeat. They ran him to the Laboner, and, and I had to run mom with me to the Laboner. We went to the Laboner all to get there with me knowing the news, but mom not knowing the news. Uh, waiting on mom to get there, uh, and I came. I had to tell mom, mom, uh, I hate to tell you this, but baby boy didn't make it. So death can happen at seven years old. It can happen at infant. It can happen at 99 years old. It doesn't matter our age today. You say, brother, why are you telling me? Because I want to remind everybody in this room today, you are human. My friend, we can have your funeral before next Sunday. Death is no respecter of person. Someone said it like this. Let me, let me finish this text. He says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's how I make it. Brother Hunt, I don't know how you do it because I have his rod. I have his staff. He's following me every day. He walks with me. He talks with me. Come on, on, on top of all that, I have the cares of life. I'm like Paul. I got all these things to deal with, church issues, church problems, church situations. And, and you can't talk to nobody because nobody understands. And you feel like you got to hold it inside. And you feel like it's just crumbling inside of you. But you know what? My God covers me. His rod and his staff comforts me. He's the one I can talk to when I can't talk to you. Or when I can't talk to my wife, guess what I can do? I can find me a closet somewhere. It's not personally a closet. It can be a private place. And I can say, God, it's me again. And I can go. Someone said it like this, and I don't know who was the writer, but he said, when you come to die, make sure that's all you have to do. Make sure you got everything covered because nothing else is going to matter. It's not going to matter how your 401k is doing when it's that time to die. It's not going to matter who gets your business when it's that comes to time to die. It doesn't matter who's going to drive your car after you're gone. It doesn't matter. We, we don't think about this enough because all we can see is, I want to get this, and I want to live like this, and I want that. Hezekiah, it was said, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel in 2 Kings chapter 18. Let me ask you today, what about you? What, are you, what is your trust in? Are you trusting that the market holds on long enough that you can have a good retirement? Retirement. Are you trusting long enough that everything's going to go the way it's supposed to go? Have you settled, let me ask you this, have you settled your affairs concerning your soul? Church, I want to tell you today, looking around the economy and all the things that we see, <clears throat> some of you had to keep me updated on media because I don't watch it no more. I refuse to watch it because I'm going to tell you why I refuse to watch it. It's a lie. Media is a lie, and I refuse to believe a lie and be damned. I refuse it. I refuse to hear that things are happening the way they are. I refuse it. But you know what? I want to ask you today. Is your affairs concerning your soul? This is why I say that because our soul today is being weighed in the balance. Let me ask you a question today. What matters the most to you right now? What would matter the most to you right now? I hope you say your soul, your destiny, your eternity. I'm hoping you got that mindset because I'm going to tell you, there's not a job in the universe that's more important than your soul. There's not a retirement plan big enough that's more important than your soul. There's not a person in this room that's, that's, that you should love more than your soul. Have you settled your affairs? We talked about the physical death, and we, 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 we go to doctors to keep physical living, don't we? How many has been to the doctor this week? Raise your hand. Nobody? Y'all did good. There's one, two, three here have been to the doctor. A few. So, but we go to the doctor for what? Why do I go to the doctor? To get a wellness check, to, to make sure I'm good. And, and if I need thyroid medicine, run my blood work. Let me know where my thyroid levels are. He gives me a thyroid pill. Guess what I do? I look at the doctor and say, thank you, doctor. I trust you. I'm going home. Take my medicine. And I take my medicine. But you let a preacher get up and preach and say, you're going to die and go to hell if you don't come to this altar. Psh, I've heard that all my life. But physically, I'm going to do what the doctor told me if we do. I mean, if I don't do what the doctor says, why go, right? So we do what the doctor says. Why? Because we want the physical body to live. I want the physical body to be in good shape. No matter how much I have to spend on the doctor when I go, if the doctor can save me and give me a few more years, I'm willing to pay it. I had an anesthesiologist one time. was about to put me to sleep when I had my wreck. He was going to do a surgery on my arm. And I, and, and I, I remember done got cerebral uh, 
bills from this doctor that put me to sleep. And I asked, I looked at him, I said, let me ask you a question. Why do you charge so much to put people to sleep? And I never forget his response right before he stuck me in the arm. He said, I don't charge to put you to sleep. I charge to wake you up. From that day forward, he can charge as much as he wants. Because I want to live. Everybody say, I want to live. I want to live and not die. But we spend all this money. When it's your time, I don't care how much money you spend, you're going to go. When the Lord has done with you on earth, you're going to go. We don't like to lose people that are thirty in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. We want to live to be at least 120. We, we don't want like to leave anybody to go out in eternity. But unless we do like Hezekiah and we get over in the flesh a little bit and that was going to die, he got into the flesh a little bit and he said, oh, God, give it. You know how good I've been. I've done this. And if you'll study it out, the sad part is Hezekiah backslid in those 15 years. He would have been better off going home with God and not backsliding 15 years earlier. And the way the tree falls, the Bible says that's the way it's going to lie. I don't want to preach this funeral, this sermon at your funeral. I want to preach it to you today. I don't want to wait until it's too late and the trees already fell and that's the way it goes. I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a lot of preachers going to have to answer for when they, when they preach a lot of people into heaven. A lot. Of, I've never been to a funeral. I mean, I've been to, a, a, now I preach funerals that I, didn't, I don't put people in heaven. I don't. If I know their lifestyle, I know I, I preached one time an alcoholic. He's a wino, the wino of the town. I preached his sermon. His daughter come up to me crying, oh, please don't put my daddy in hell. I'll put him in heaven. And I looked at her and I said, honey, I don't put nobody in heaven and I don't put him in hell. He's already preached his life. And he preached it. That, that, you know what? So many preachers preach funerals today. It doesn't matter it, what kind of life they lived. Uh, they uh, say these words, uh, one day we'll see them again in heaven. Why do they do that? To comfort the flesh. To make you feel better about losing your loved one. That's why it is. That's what we do. But that's why I preach the way I preach. That's why I don't pull back any punches. That's why I don't hold back because I want the church to know we're getting ready. Are you prepared? Let me ask you today, what about your spiritual death? Uh, what about what's done died inside of you? Uh, the worship is not there no more. The altar time is not there no more. You don't come around the front no more. And, and, and I'm going to be honest with you. you got to quit saying, but they don't sing what I like, so I'm not going to be up there. Get over that mess. You're not worshiping the song. You're worshiping who? Jesus is the one we worship in. That's who we're worshiping. Come on, we're in a spiritual battle. Let me ask you today before I get ready to close here in about 20 minutes. Who has prepared for death? Let, I mean, I'm just going to be curious. It's just because I'm talking about death and you're already intrigued what I'm talking about. How many has got your funeral arrangement already done? Raise your hand. Got, we got a couple. It's okay. It's, you don't have to be scared to raise your hand. I mean, uh, I don't. I don't even have a wheel made. I don't, I don't have nothing to give away anyway. They, I'm going to let my three boys fight over what I got. And uh, they're probably going to fight over, over my guns. That's probably all they want anyway. But nevertheless, I don't, I'm not. But you know what? I, I, I say that jokingly laughing, but they could be doing that between now and next Sunday. But we live in a time that we don't, we're not prepared for death. And by the way, I want y'all to look at the calendar. We have, we have a, um, uh, a weekend that's going to be here Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, talking about at the end of your life. And, and, and if you want to look at retirement things and things you might be interested in, we're going to have it on a Friday night. We'll have a meal first, and then we're going to sit down and talk. We've got Brother Drury that's from the stewardship. He's going to be coming and talking to us, very experienced. And he's going to show Christians how they can give at the end of their life and still be a blessing for their family, the church, and everything around them. So you don't want to miss that. Make sure you ask about it. You, we want everybody to come to it. It's going to be good. But uh, look at that because these things we don't like to talk about. Ten years ago, I was going to have the, young, the same guy to come here, and I kept putting it off because I was, I was only 39. No, nah, who wants to talk about that? No one want to talk about that mess. But, but when I kept thinking about it, I said, I'm ten years too late. I should have already done it for our church. But that's coming up, so make sure you're here. Make sure you plan that because we don't want to talk about death. I mean, who wants to go plan out their funeral? I mean, who wants to do that? Nobody. But this is the thing. And I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm trying to get to the good part of this sermon because all that's kind of got y'all depressed now. <laughs> I'm 
I was sitting there thinking this morning, I was praying, I think, God, I'm kind of down to talk about death today. I don't want nobody to think, oh, Lord, I don't want to. I mean, it does. It kind of bothers you a little bit when you think about it, especially when you get a little older. You think, oh, my God, I don't like that. I, I don't like. But watch this. This is where I really want to get to though, today, though. How many is ready to die? How many knows what John chapter 3 and 3 says? I'm going to read this, and I'm going to show you something. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born again? Can he do that? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And let me just show you something. We know that's talking about our salvation. You got to be born again. In order for me to be born again, something has to happen. I got to die. In order for me to be born again spiritually, I got to die. How do I die, brother? I got to die out to my old life. I got to tell that old life I'm done with sin. I repent of the drugs I've done. I repent of the alcohol I've done. I repent of the nicotine that had me bound all these years. I, I repent of all of these things. And I got to die to be born again. And when I die, then I can be raised to be lived again. But when I die, what has to happen? When I die, I tell you what I want you to do. I want you all to do this for me. I want you all to put me in a casket and just leave me sitting right here in the casket. Don't bury me. And some of you are like, what? You're going to stink by the third day. You're right. You know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to put me into the grave. You've got to bury me. Let, let me give an illustration right quick. I need to get everybody to understand because we have ministers all across this place that baptize people. We have got to be careful of baptizing people and their foot comes out of the water. Baptizing people and their hand comes up out of the water. You can't do that. Baptism is submerging them. I'm going to just tell you, you don't sprinkle somebody and think they're buried. You bury them. If you if you, if you got some of those that you might want to get somebody to hold that kid's foot down. I mean, I, I bat, we, we baptized a, a gentleman back here one time. We had to baptize him three times. Man, he was scared. He jumped up. He raised his whole body out of the water. And finally, I told somebody, hold his feet and don't let him go. And we baptized him. And you got to make sure when you baptize him that you take him all the way up. Don't leave their nose sticking up. For sure, baptize their nose. For sure, baptize their head because this is where all the mess comes from. All the thinking. And if people get nosy and get up in your business, but when you baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ, they come up a new creature. <laughs> Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now, a lot of people say, oh, Brother Hunt, that's just to be exaggerating a little bit. You're, you're taking overboard a little bit. You, don't need, you know what? People like you, what's wrong with the church today? Is, is cutting it a little here and cutting a little there and cutting a little off over here and doing a little bit less here. And Come on, I'm going to tell you, your, your pastor sees you. I'm your shepherd. I know where you're at. I know where you're struggling at. I know you're struggling a little bit on, on attendance and faithfulness, and I, I know your holiness is not quite where it needs to be, and I'm not going to be one of those going to run out there and just say, bless God, you better get things right. You better do what you need to do. Because if I do, it's going to make the flesh mad. And you're going to run down the street and try to get that pastor to understand why you left this church to go to this church. But I want to tell you, it doesn't matter what church you go to, there's going to be some hypocrites in every one of them. There's going to be some mean people in every one of them. There's going to be some problems in every one of them. This is what we got to learn to do, though. we got to stay spiritually with God. Because if you would be buried in the name of Jesus Christ, the old man's going to come alive and you will be born again. So you got to die. You gotta die. So let me ask you again, are you ready to die? Music, get ready to come. Church, God wants me to remind you of something today. All that is promised to us in life, there's a bunch of a book full of promises. And I love his promises. The Holy Ghost, he says, is promised unto you, your children, them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. We can go on with promises all day long, but I want to tell you this: death is also a promise. But the question is this: are you ready for it? Are you ready to die? In the flesh, as we all know, any of us could have eternally something going on and not know it, right? Everybody in this room today, you can have something inside your body that's eating at you right now and you not know it. And then you go to the doctor and they say, I'm sorry, it's too late. 
my, my dad would always say, when I turn, when I, I can't wait till I get 65 to get my insurance, I'm going to go to the doctor. My dad was coughing up blood about three years before that. But he was waiting on the insurance to start to kick in. And when I go to the doctor, I'm going to find out what this is. I believe it's just a bleeding usher because I had ushers years ago. And, you know, he was just coughing up and wiping off, going about his business. But then all of a sudden, he turned 65, made an appointment with a doctor. And he was eat up with eternal cancer. His lungs were ate up with cancer. The doctors looked at him and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Hunt, but we'll give you six months without anything or a year with chemotherapy and radiation. I was standing there when the doctor looks at him, and what do you say? My dad looks at me and says, well, it is what it is. Give me my britches. I'm going home. My dad went home to die exactly what the doctor said. Six months later, he died. I had never talked about this. I don't like talking about it, but God gave me this today to tell you. Everyone in this room, it could be you next. I'm not here to scare you, but I'm telling you this. Everybody look at me real quick. If you don't hear nothing I said, it's time to quit playing with God. Sir, you done played long enough. You're trying to hide. You're trying to run long enough. It's time to quit. You're not here by accident today. God told you this is a day that you're going to go, and you're going to hear a man preach a sermon that's going to sound really crazy. It's going to sound really overboard. It's going to sound like, well, you, you hear me today. I know why God gave me. I had another message ready for today. And last night, sitting in my office yesterday afternoon, God just began to speak to me. I said, oh, God, what are we going to do with it? You know, it's too late now, he told my dad. If I could have saw you a few years earlier, I might have could have worked on this. There's really nothing we can do now. Or today you could have perfect health. I feel, like I, I feel like I do, I think, I guess. That's all I know is I'm guessing. Perry, you're a young, strong guy. I guess you look like you're all right. You may have perfect health. We could be, have perfect, a perfect life, everything, no, no sickness, no meds. I love the people that I talk to that's in their 70s, and they say, all I take is an aspirin every now and then. I go, oh, man, that's awesome. I love you. God bless you. Perfect health. You could be that person, picture perfect health. But you can leave today and a bus run over you. You can leave today and eat something poison at, at the Chinese restaurant. You could. You could do it, it could happen at McDonald's. It can happen in Old Charlie. We can, you don't, we don't know. That's where we are today. No, no wine because no matter how perfect you are, anything could happen. But again, my question to you today, are you ready to die? In the natural, none of us are ready to die. But my job today is to get you ready to die spiritually. My job today is to tell you this, what the prophet told Hezekiah. It's time to get your house in order, sir. Let me ask you dads that think you're Superman and you got it all together. What's going to happen if today was your day? Is your house in order? Is your house ready? I think we know what sin is, and we read about it all the time. And, and we even preached about it not too long ago. But, but how is your soul doing? You know, we can talk about sin if you want to, but we, I've been on sin heavy the last couple Sundays. But let me ask you this. How is your soul doing with your brother that's in church with you? How about your sister in church with you? You can have all the... Dot, the I's dotted and all the T's crossed and how you're supposed to act. But if you got something all against your brother or your sister in the church, you're just as bad as the worst sinner in the church. You say, why are you saying all this, brother? Because I'm your pastor. Some of you are dealing with some issues, but I'm here to tell you today, you got to die out to that. How has your attitude been lately? Let's talk about our attitude. We know what sin is. We can call it out if you want to. But how's your attitude? Have you had a proud look? Have you had a lying tongue? Have you had the hands that shed innocent blood? Have you had a heart that divides the wicked imaginations? Have you been swift to running to mischief? 
They've been a false witness, speaking lies. Or are you so in discord? Why you say all that, Brother Hunt? Because it's scripture. I didn't give you the scripture text, but it's scripture, Proverbs chapter 6 and 16. And it says the, the discord in the last verse, these, or first he said in 16, these are things that the Lord hates. Those things that I just named, the Lord hates. He said, but the last one is abomination unto him. When I'm sowing discord among my brethren, do I need to give a lesson on discord? When one brother on this side of the church goes over and tells this brother, hey, do you know what Brother Hunt done? Do you believe, do you agree with what Brother Hunt done? I'm gonna, I don't think nobody here does that, but I'm going to tell you what it takes for a man or a woman to do that. It takes a coward to run behind a man of God and talk about him versus coming to his face and say, Pastor, I want to talk to you. I want to deal with this situation. What's going on? And to top it all off, that's abomination unto God. Why are you saying that? Because I'm telling you, if you got any of these in your life, if you got any of these that I just named, you're not ready to die. Your soul's not right. Your heart's not right. You're struggling. You got a bitterness in you that's killing you, sir. You got a bitterness that's that made you get away from God so far. Oh, you're here, but you're not here. Y'all know what I'm saying? You could be in church and not be here. Some of you right now at McAllister's instead of here. Are we thinking about that potato? You see what I'm saying? We get in that avenue of mindset. But church, I come today to tell you, we need to rethink some things in our lives and prepare for death because it's coming. Whether if it's today or whether if it's 39 years from now, whenever it is, it's coming. Would you stand with me? If you're ready to die, I want you to stand. If you're ready to die today and you got everything ready, Revelation chapter 21 says this, if you're ready to die and you go to heaven, God's going to wipe away all the tears from your eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat up on the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha. I'm the omega from the beginning to the end. I will give unto him that is thirst of the fountain of water life freely. This is what God's going to give you. He's going to give it to you freely for those who are thirsty. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. Woo! Hallelujah. He's going to be my God. And he shall be my son. Then it gets to verse 8. It says, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Are you ready to die? Maybe you just got a little nudge in your soul saying, go pray that everything's right today. I want to invite you to come to this altar. I want to tell you today, please don't run from what God has told you today in your heart. It's about time. God's getting ready. I don't know. We all might live until we're catching away. I don't know. But I do know this. You've got to die to get to heaven. Would you come and surrender your life to God? Lord, I ask you to touch those that are coming. Lord, I know it's appointed unto man once to die, then after this to judgment. But God, today, we want to die out to the old man. We want a new man, a new woman to walk in our shoes. We want to join in with the heavenly host today and rejoice as people are getting saved, changing our lives. Come on. This altar is open for every visitor, every mom, every dad. If I were you, I'd grab my child and I'd say, come on, honey. We need to pray. We need to make sure we're ready to meet God. Come on, Dad. Would you bring your children? Come on, Mom. Would you bring those children? Come on, let's get, let's get our hearts right. Let's seek after God with everything we got in our hearts right now. Would you come? Would you come today? Come on, everybody would. Would everybody in this room find a place and pray? Say, God, I want to know I'm ready to die. I want to know everything's right, God. Touch them today in Jesus' name. Come on, sir. Don't put it off another Sunday. Your kids mean the world to you, but their souls waiting to balance today. Come on, that's it. Pray with somebody. Pray with somebody.
spirit will move all across this campus today, Lord. Everywhere people are standing, let them feel your Holy Ghost today, Jesus. Ready.